534. So let's go ahead and call to order the September 28 meeting of the Montpelier Planning Commission. Um, first thing we need to do is approve the agenda. So if everyone will take a look and get a uh, motion on that. We have a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Okay, motion by Stephanie. I'll second. Second by John. We don't have Barb here, so we need like, you know, heavier lifting for motions. Um, okay, all in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, agenda approved. Um, so the, the next item here is for comments from the chair. Um, the, the only thing on my mind right now is uh, the downtown core master plan that Mike sent around. Uh, encourage everyone to take a look at that. It's loaded with ideas. Um, Mike and I were just talking about how, I mean, the document doesn't seem to be like a binding document because it's, um, it has a lot of ideas and suggestions throughout, and then it has some recommendations at the end uh, where it's recommending some of the options over others. Um, but it looks like, you know, it's, it doesn't look like it's going to dictate necessarily everything that's going to happen. So but anyways, but it is interesting. It's something that was passed by the city council. So, and it happened during our kind of dead period when we weren't meeting in late March. Uh, so, you know, I know I'm not caught up on this thing at all. So. Uh, I think people should take a look. And when we get to the land use portion of the city plan, we will at least probably, you know, spend a little time looking at this thing to inform that discussion. Um, that's all I've got. Uh, does anybody else have any announcements or anything to share? Okay. Um, the other thing uh, that I uh, have is, uh, the housing working group did meet. Uh, we did some talking about things. Um, I put some ideas out there. Barb had put some ideas out there. Uh, Barb is very concerned about scope. So we might not want to meet again until <laughs> we have like a, more of a scope fleshed out from the continuity and structure working group. Um, but we you know, failed at meeting. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think there was any kind of due date for you guys anyway. So I'm not saying that to put pressure on you. I'm just saying that that, that we, might. We tried. Be. We just failed, but we'll oh. try again. <laughs> oh, Mar Marcel and I met, but we failed and lost John. <laughs> okay. Which, there was an email exchange and it was it got confusing. So sorry, John. <laughs> it's, so we'll, it's, we'll catch John up and meet again shortly. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's no problem at all. Um, you know, I don't know. I feel like I, I'm not too caught up on on the scope. I mean, the idea is for us to get together and do some work, and you know, just an extension of what we're trying to do in the planning commission. But um, those conversations might come up. Um, like I said, Barb was concerned about it. Um, okay, uh, that's good. That's a good update. It's good to know. And yeah, we'll look forward to hearing from you guys. Do, do you do you plan to meet in the next two weeks? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah, well, we plan to meet in the next two weeks. Yeah. Oh, okay. You do? Okay. Good. Uh, so yeah, you can give us an update next time then. Uh, uh, yeah, and yeah, we probably won't have any other working group meetings in the meantime. Um, okay. So that sounds good. Uh, the next item on the agenda is general business. Uh, do we have anyone from the public who would like to discuss anything that's not on the agenda? Basically, anything that doesn't have to do with potential zoning changes related to uh, uh, Barry Street. Not sure, Andrew. If you want to uh, unmute yourself, you're welcome to try to go and let us know what your if you're here for the Sabins zoning or if you're here for something else. Well, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not 100 percent sure I'm in the right meeting. I was. Uh, let me pull you up. I was asked by Sean White and the friends of the Newski to 
be part of tonight's meeting with regards to the boat launch, but I have a feeling she may have gotten her meetings. Confused. Yeah, boat launch so, isn't, isn't in our isn't on our agenda for the planning commission. Well, that's what I thought, and and Audra was dealing with it. Um, so I think Sean may have just had the wrong the wrong meeting for me to attend. Um, so. I'm just a visitor <laughs> who, who, if this isn't pertaining to me, I'm just going to say good night. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, All right. Andrew. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and I thought, I thought we had someone on the phone. Are they gone? Uh, Andrew is on the phone. Okay. Um, there's this 802522 number. That's him. Oh, is that Andrew that's on the phone too? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's me. I, my computer doesn't do though. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm going to hang. Yeah. Okay. So without any other business, we will move along to the discussion of the potential zoning changes where, you know, Mike can explain the situation for us. So Mike, I, I guess I had assumed that Daniel Richardson or someone would come in tonight, but Oh, are we working on the minutes or are we? Oh, I'm sorry. I did. I skipped the minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's do the minutes first. Sorry about that. Uh, got it a little ahead of myself. So if everyone would take a look at the minutes that Mike sent from September 14. I guess I have a quick question, um, and I apologize for forgetting, but did we need to do any follow-up on the banner situation? Uh, that wasn't that wasn't my impression, no. I think he was going to um, connect with the city manager's office. Okay, and then we were just getting ahead that for like later down the road if we needed to make a opinion about it. I got the sense that he wasn't sure he just what he expected from us, but by the end of it, it became clear that we weren't directly involved. So, okay. you know, just for our information. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. Is there was the request really for a hundred plus housing units? Sorry, Marcella. Okay. Was it really a hundred plus? Is that the is that the right number? Mike? It's big, right? Uh yeah, that's pretty pretty much where they're at. Okay. Just make sure that's accurate. Um okay. Well, we have a motion from Marcella to approve the minutes. We have a second. I'll second. Second from Stephanie. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Minutes are approved. Now we can get on to business. And at my question for Mike before he, you know, explains the whole uh, landscape to us was, so we're not having any witnesses about this? Uh, they, so they were aware, um, and there was somebody who said they were going to try to make it tonight, but um, really a lot of this is stuff that I've worked very directly with them on. So I'm uh, very familiar with exactly what the request is and what the issues are, um, having talked them over with the zoning administrator and some of the other folks. So I'm, I'm comfortable answering the questions and handling this presentation. So um, I guess I can just jump into a quick summary. Um, so everybody knows, or if people don't know, um, you know, Sabin's Pasture out on Berry Street has been, has come up from time to time as a, a location for potential future development. Um, there was a large project that was proposed probably back in 2006. Uh, it had to get an Act 250. It was a very, very large proposal, like 500 units or something like that. It was going to be an extensive development through there. 
Um, the neighbors kind of rose up against it and formed the Friends of Saban's Pasture and uh, the Act 250. Don't, I don't know if it formally got appealed, but eventually things kind of settled down. Everybody agreed to mediation. The Trust for Public Lands kind of helped to moderate things and they came into a, an agreement with a different development team to kind of put in 150, 160 units um, and have some conserved land and have a couple. So it's gonna meet a number of goals. That was all wrapped up and completed in 2008, 2009, just in time for the Great Recession and that deal went flat. Um, the family, the Zorzi Aja family still own the farm. Um, it's not being farmed anymore, but the open land is still owned. Um, by the family and they are still interested in selling it. Um, some of the owners are, are getting older and are really interested in moving it along at this point, um, either to sell it to a developer or develop it themselves. Uh, so Doug Zorzi uh, tends to be one of the, the main players. He lives, on, lives across the street there. So he's one of the main players and uh, another gentleman, Alan Goldman, who's a local um, de uh, developer has also taken an interest in, in trying to facilitate a project there. So the two of them are, are, kind of, are working to work on some ideas and see what they can do. We've got the TIF, so the tax increment finance, which allows public infrastructure that needs to support private development. Uh, they are in the TIF district, at least the lower part of Saban's Pasture is, is in the TIF district. So some of the public infrastructure needs like sewer and water and roads, those are potential um, investment uh, that we could put in to assist that project because we're trying to keep the units affordable and to put in all the infrastructure is gonna start to make the project unaffordable to, to folks. So we wanna try to do what we can. So in, in similar to like the parking garage and a couple other projects, we kind of have two, two different groups going at the same time in the city. Uh, one group is working through the manager's office and they're working on the, the, the public private partnership side of this, this deal. So what private interests and in, in, you know, how much is the city gonna contribute? And if the city is gonna contribute, what do we want? Um, so, you know, like we can't through our zoning regulations require public access to a park, um, but they can through the, through the, a, a, an agreement to go through and say, hey, we've got TIF. If we're going to use TIF and we're, or we're going to use other public funds, we want something in return. And our other thing we want in return is a public access to a park and uh, a protection of certain features. And so that side of things is really being managed through the manager's office. What my office looks at is really kind of the, the more nuts and bolts of the regulations, um, you know, what can they do? What are they required to do? What can we do, um, you know, to help them get through the process? And so on that front, um, the development team in Sabins has talked to us about um, what needs they have. So they're, they've, they've just done some conceptual stuff. They have no applications in. They're just talking in conceptual, um, worlds right now and some of the things that have come up deal with um, it's it's a subdivision conditional use so it's going to touch on traffic requirements and what are we going to require from them um, so we're going to require a traffic study um, but they don't know how this is going to play out because of the berry and main intersection obviously traffic leaving um, a portion of that traffic is going to head down um, into town, into the city, and it's going to impact that intersection, which is a failed intersection, but the city has plans to improve it. How do we, how did they navigate that process? And so there are a number of these um, barriers that come up. And as we look deeper into the zoning, we find a few others that tend to come up um, that'll present barriers to, to make projects not be able to happen there. Um, so what they gave us was in that memo was really 
one of the four big changes. We had talked, I talked with Dan Richardson, who's their attorney, um, in depth about all four, and his, his memo kind of outlined just one, which was to look at the conditional use traffic requirements and to getting into the details of that was really, if we just struck that section A, a lot of the problems go away. And um, if you read his memo, you, you could see that he really kind of laid out a case that said, the performance standard is there um, above, and therefore we really don't need A um, for the Development Review Board to have every right to deny this application if they felt so. But at this point, there's kind of a gray box. What do you do when you've got an, an, an intersection that's a, a level F or level E or level D? We don't have any way of being able to assess that because the, the regulations are silent. Um, so what do we do with these, you know, a, a class F intersection? Um, what is really important is in that number two that the DRB can look at whether the traffic generated by the proposed development, whether it is unreasonable and disproportionately contributes to a reduction in level of service for the affected streets and intersections for all modes of travel. So um, the question is, if we, if they put housing in and let's say their traffic model said it would make traffic at the Barry intersection go from three minutes and 30 seconds to three minutes and 40 seconds delay. It is a delay, it is making things worse, but is that you know, unreasonable and disproportionate? Um, it's already a failed intersection. It has nothing to do with anything that they've done. Um, at the same time, the way this is written, even a very small project, if somebody else on Barry Street decided they wanted to go from a, a four unit to a five unit and it was a conditional use, they would have to meet this traffic requirement and theoretically would be denied because even adding one more car to that intersection would, you know, would make it worse because of substitute, because of the little letter A, it, it puts them in a position where they probably you know, could we even approve that? And so what they felt was, we have all the ammunition. If, this, if the Development Review Board wants to deny this project, they certainly could based on the standard that's written in point A and, and the conditions in one, two, and three. Um, the DRB has all the power that they need to be able to manage traffic and to evaluate traffic. And, you know, under point B, it's gonna be required to have a traffic study. So, you know, that's not an issue. Um, and, and the real issue is just with that little letter A. Um, and I can get to the other three, which are, which are a little bit easier to, to talk about, but that was really their, their first one and their primary one was that they felt traffic was gonna be very difficult for them to evaluate. Um, okay, so does anybody have questions about the first? I guess we, we can just take these items as they, as they come here. So does anyone have any questions about this? And I sent a strikeout copy earlier today for anyone who may have gotten it. Yeah, I have that pulled up. I, I felt that was a little yeah. easier to review. It's going to be, yeah, pretty much need it pulled up to review the exact language here. So, uh, so looks that, like oops, sorry. So that language in 2A, um, I'm looking at your strikeout copy that says class one or class two streets shall be maintained at a level of service of at least C. Does that just mean if it, if they don't meet that, it just gets denied. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's the un that's that's the unspoken question. Is okay. Well, what do we do if you're on a class one and two street? Barry and Main intersection is class one and class two, um, and that intersection is currently uh, a level F. So if you have to maintain it at a level C. Uh, for unsignalized and D for signalized. So it's currently unsignalized. It will become signalized under um, a proposal. The, the Barry Main scoping study said they're gonna put in a, a light there and it'll improve that intersection. Now, whether it'll improve it from an F to a D is unknown at this time. It probably won't. Um, but the question is if you, if they, if, if the improvement to that intersection doesn't meet a D, then what? There's, it's silent on that 
but specific situation. Right. Well, I would just say from a conceptual standpoint, I'm, I feel strongly that I wouldn't want an intersection that we already know has failed to be the reason that we don't add new housing when we know we need new housing. That doesn't seem to make any sense to me. <laughs> but. Yeah, yeah and, and Mike, the, um, the background for how this subsection ended up in the zoning, uh, if, if I remember, this came from city council, the planning commission had come up, we were at a loss to be honest about how to deal with traffic. We didn't understand what this stuff really meant even after it was explained to us. So we came up with something, the city council rejected it as it should have because we were clueless. Uh, but then it did this, which one might argue is also clueless. Um, so I think that's kind of the history here anyway. Uh, and Mike, you can augment my statements if you yeah, want. Yeah, that. Yeah, a little bit of the history on that. Um, the the part that's being struck was the part that was inserted by our consultant that we had been working that we'd been working with, and we through the planning commission and or came up with a different number one and number two. So when it got to city council. They had a different one and two, but A was, you know, this A and B were still here. When it got to council, they didn't like how one and two were laid out. So Tom McCardle, who was director at the time, said, you know what, I'm going to take a little bit of time. And he came up with, this is what he wants to look at because their staff does our traffic impact analysis for us. We don't in, in our planning department have the background on that. So we Anytime we have a traffic analysis, we send it over to them as end traffic engineers, they take a look at it, they give an evaluation, they said, this is what we would look at, one and two. They replaced the one and they replaced the two, but they kept the A and they kept the B, um, which is kind of why if you look at them as, as together, and, and I think Dan Richardson points this out, that you know the, the little letter A almost doesn't even talk to its requirement above it. And that's because they really were built in two different pieces. And, and, and that's why I'm, I'm, a, I'm okay. And I would support striking it because I, I think everything we need is there. And the DRB has all the information to approve or deny whether little letter A is there, little, little A is not. Um, I think the power is there for them to make uh, an informed decision on whether something is unreasonable and disproportionate. Um, whether a small change to a project results in five more cars, they easily have the ability to say um, that's not unreasonable and it's not disproportionate. But at the same time, as Tom pointed out when he was arguing for the new number two, um, it could be unreasonable and disproportionate if you had, say, an intersection that was operating at a level A and somebody proposed a project that was going to be big and was going to take it from an A to a C. Well, according to little letter A, that's, we would have to approve that, even though it really is making um, you know, a disproportionate impact on the intersection. It could prevent future development from happening in that same area because that one project has used, basically used up all of the, the capacity of that intersection. So they could approve that project, but they could also deny that project. But little letter A kind of starts to, to muddy the waters. Um, and, and the sense was a little bit unnecessarily. Well, I, I have um, one question here just for everyone to, to think about. Um, for the same reason that Stephanie mentioned about, about letting traffic get in the way of, of things uh, you know, too much, uh, I don't necessarily want this, but currently sub two says that uh, proposed development shall not unreasonably and disproportionately contribute. That is a seems to me like a really hard hurdle. I mean, I don't, it's hard to imagine something being both of those and being rejected. Uh, but this, for instance, something could be unreasonable, but because it just contributes to something that's really out of control in a very direct way, but compared maybe with other similar uses or similar development, it's not disproportionate. And it just seems like something that can, I don't know, that it's, I don't know, it seems like really hard for the DRB to ever even 
strictly enforce that standard. You could change the and to an or, but probably the. Yeah, let's see. That's that's what I'm getting at. I mean, if if we actually were concerned about that standard being used, I think it makes sense as an or. Uh, I just want to see what other people thought about it. I don't know. I mean, I think the whole notion of these standards are ridiculous. Um, like calling our these intersections in our downtown failing. They're just these outdated metrics that you know. I think California has just outlawed them altogether. The reality is if we're banning things based on traffic impacts, we're just pushing development out further that they're just going to drive into our downtown anyway, right? Like we're just increasing the vehicle miles traveled. So like when really should we be using traffic as the reason to deny a project? It has more to do with circulation and is there like an immediate um a uh, solution that could help improve circulation, like should there be a signalized intersection or roundabout as an entrance to the subdivision? Like, is there something reasonable that an applicant can do that would make the situation better as opposed to, you know, oh, we would like growth here and here are all the parameters we've set out and all the design requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and thanks for building all of that. You can't build here because you're gonna contribute, you know, more to our, downtown which we want to be bustling like what that doesn't make any sense um so yeah i mean i advocated it for it before and and uh, uh for just getting rid of all of it together getting rid of it altogether at least for our downtown and immediate area where we want development if as a city we're going to commit to providing the infrastructure that allow for development to happen there um, but, you know, like the, uh, we always have this straw man of, of the A intersection that this mysterious development will drop it to an F, like, can that, is there actually any situation we can think of where that'll happen? Um, and, you know, maybe there is, but I, I'm struggling to imagine it. So if, if what's being proposed, you know, meets the applicants need, and I want to also be respectful to public works, uh, you know, it'd be nice. They want something objective to look at, right? That's not going to mess up the system that they're managing. So when when we're looking at unreasonable or, or disproportionate, can we add, if we're going to keep those, can we at least just add a number? Like, are they adding more than 20% uh, vehicle trips for that intersection? You know, like, if we can start quantifying these things, I think applicants and probably DPW and, and then planning staff could review it and say, you know, this number is greater than this number, you know, here's here's the next step there. So um, I that's my rant. I, I'm gonna get up for a second. I can still hear everyone. I just have to go turn the oven off. But so John, would you be I'm not like walking out and uh <laughs> dropping the mic you're not storming I out drop, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah i have some follow-up questions for you though about i mean are, are we talking you, you mentioned adding in percentages or something but could we are you are you also considering maybe dropping something like sub two so that we are only looking at one and three dropping what like like sub two here is the part about traffic generated unreasonable disproportionate that stuff if you if we remove that entirely, then the other two standards that are here for traffic is one of them is one that you touched on, which seems like maybe you'd be in favor of, which would be reasonable measures have been taken to minimize or mitigate the amount of traffic. Because that is something we want them to at least consider, right? And then the first one is that the volume type and timing of traffic generated by the proposed development shall not be substantially greater than what would normally occur at nearby uses and other permitted uses in the neighborhood, which for Barry Street would be a lot, I would think. Uh, or planned uses, you know. It says permitted, so, I mean. Right. If we're looking at what's, if it's if it's similar to what's permitted on Barry Street, then that seems like a lot. Uh, I, I don't know. Like, so. Are, but it's like, what? it's if, it, if it's, similar to what's permitted then how how would someone be it's either permitted or it's not right 
If it's not, then it would be not permitted. Um, yeah, it kind of takes care of itself, yeah. But it's a standard. Right. So for, for people who want a standard to look at. Right, it's a pretty easy box to check. <laughs> yeah. I, I think what number one is looking at is a little bit of, um, you know, if let's say there's a certain amount of truck traffic that occurs and your truck traffic is relatively in the same time frame as these others, um, that's one thing. But if your truck traffic everybody else's trucks are from nine to five and your trucks are going to be at six in the morning to eight in the morning. You know, that's one where it might be looking at that to go through and say, we'll be, you know, looking at the other uses in the neighborhood, you know, the traffic generated is going to be of a different type or different. It, it will have a different impact on the character of the neighborhood. And if it is a, a residential neighborhood truck traffic that early in the morning could be more disproportionate. But if, it's the same truck traffic on Barry Street that's going on that everybody else has going on at the same times and then it's in the same measure, then it probably will meet the standard of, you know, ultimately the question is whether it will have an undue adverse effect upon the traffic in the area. Um, and ultimately that's what we're trying to evaluate. Um, so just real quick, so I don't want to, I don't want to bog us down here. I mean, is there any interest in doing anything like going further than what Mike's suggesting here to remove anything additional? Um, yeah, I'd be interested in removing, if I'm understanding correctly, just the whole of number two. Um, yeah, I, I, along with that, would we would sub A become like the new sub two? Or are we talking about removing that? Sub A here is the development review board may factor in the results of a traffic impact study when one is required. But that that's something that's that's something that's linked to that language in two right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, we could, I think we could promote that up to its own number two. So number one would be number one, number two would be that one, and number three would be reasonable measures have been taken to minimize or mitigate the amount of vehicular traffic on the proposed development. That's usually the one that gets thrown in for people who need to have turning lanes. Um, you know, what can we pin to the developer to go through and say, yeah, we're going to do this, um, but you know, you can mitigate your traffic impacts by putting in a turning lane. Okay. So, uh, do we do we have a motion to? Uh, or yeah, let I me mean, let's do this. Let's do this one motion at a time for each of the items. Uh, so, do we have a motion to? Uh, delete sub two and A and to turn the current sub B into a sub two? Yes. Okay, so John's making that motion. Second. Seconded by Stephanie. All in favor of that change, say aye. Aye. Uh, oh, there's this, oh, I'm sorry, I did skip a step there. There's, there is discussion. There's enough there's a discussion step. Do we have any further discussion before we go to a vote on this? Well, yeah. I, I do have a question. Um, so if we just have the development review board may factor in the results of the traffic impact study. I mean, I'm just worried about if it's a controversial development, can that be used to, you know, kill a new development project? And I, I don't quite Maybe somebody else can answer that for me because I don't quite understand. Be a weird appeal that to suggest that the DRB didn't chose not to consider, or they may. It is an odd like. We can we can standard, but we can clarify we can clarify what it means by uh, adding a lead-in language that says, in applying the other two standards, comma. The development review board may factor in the results of a traffic impact study. In which case, we should probably move it down to 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 swap swap it with three so that it comes at the end. So, just a question. I'm just sort of wondering if we even need that language. So, the development review board, do they fact? They, I mean, if they're looking at this because it's traffic, they can consider. They just already can do that. I don't know. I'm not saying this eloquently at all, but I'm wondering why we even need to state that. Yeah, I figured that the DRB would look at a traffic impact study in any instance, right? I mean, that's right. Just, uh, yeah, that's 
probably probably a fair fair assessment if we give them the power under point b to have a traffic impact study and to require one then it's not that much of a reach to go and say that they can actually use the results of it in fact uh if we if we did include it it could be construed as limiting meaning they can't look at other things so it may end up hurting the they, yeah or they may factor in when one is required but what if i mean does it ever happen that one isn't required and there is one it's just a confusing sentence i agree so right because b says sorry B says that the development review board may require an applicant to submit a professional prepared traffic impact study. So if they do that, they're obviously going to be reviewing that, right? Right, and to suggest that they, this almost suggests that they should be looking at something else, right? All right, I'll amend the motion to toss that, to toss to, to delete all of sub two, sub A, and sub B. I will yeah. second the updated motion. Yeah. Okay. So I'm and, sorry, I have a quick question before we vote on this, um, just because I had some distractions going on while we were discussing this. What's the, what's the, in, an, in a quick brushstroke, why get rid of the core sub two? I understand getting rid of A and B, but uh that uh i mean maybe john could feel this i mean my impression is that you know as we're thinking that it's an unnecessary standard uh we don't see anything there that's uh as relevant as one and three one and three covers what our concerns are with traffic yeah i i you, you missed my rant before having to turn the 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 oven off um where, and this is, uh, happened at the, uh, when we originally passed it in the, uh, the Zoning and Sensitivity Council, which I think are the ones who added this, but we felt that the notion of level of uh, the LOS and uh, the spirit of this is sort of in a dated engineering standard and, and really the notion of a failed intersection um, like Barry and Maine in our downtown is just uh, uh, not a concept that makes a whole lot of sense when we're trying to encourage development. And our goal is not to like have cars fly through um, downtown Montpelier as fast as possible. So if we're if we're denying developments based on this, um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because we're just pushing it out further and would increase the number of okay. vehicle miles traveled anyway. Um, but at the same time, you know, we want to know, are there things that applicants can do to in, improve circulation for all um, modes of travel, like putting in a signalized intersection or roundabout, but not, uh, not create a situation where, you know, the last one in uh, has to either pay for everything or uh, nothing can ever happen again. I guess uh, sort of just to put a fine point on it. Um, I guess my question is, is does the level of service issue is that do you feel like that's taken care of in sub A and three? Do you have an answer, John? You're muted. You're Still muted, John. You're muted, John. Saying I'm on a small screen here and I lost that tab. So I was trying to look up what those were specifically here. I, I guess my only concern is, is does the level of service piece that's discussed in sub two, does that have value in how the, the DRB approaches the and that's, question? That's what John is saying is outdated. He's saying he's saying he doesn't think it has value. That it fair enough. Okay, so uh, do we have any more discussion? Okay, uh, those in favor of 
suggesting that uh, the section be amended to remove sub two and subparts A and B. Uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that's 6 0 uh, for that recommendation. All right, so what's, uh, what's the next one, Mike? And everybody's comfortable with the rest of how that section works? Or one and now three would now be two? I guess kind of went over with Coleman. Um, so the next one's really easy. Um, if you flip over to the, the next page of what I had sent, which is looking in, in the subdivision standards, 3504 also talks about traffic, except it had slightly different rules. So um, when the city council adjusted some of the language, they adjusted it in conditional use, but never reflected it in um, the subdivision. So what I put, what I, what we discussed here in the office was just to come up with some language to the effect of the traffic provisions for subdivisions shall be the same as those that apply to conditional use applications in section 3303, except that the word subdivision shall be substituted for development where applicable. In that way, as we make changes to traffic requirements under one standard, it's going to be the same standard applying in, in both cases and not making a different analysis. This would get especially complicated if somebody was doing a subdivision for a conditional use application, if their traffic analysis actually could be, they could actually be approved under one and not approved under the other, but by making them the same, it's gonna, it makes the most sense. It doesn't make any sense to have a different traffic requirement. Uh, I mean, drafting wise, I, uh, I guess it's fine to say the word subdivision shall be substitute for development. Um, I think that that would be confusing in any scenario. Okay. That's the only thought I have then would be make sure people understand what that really means. Yeah, I mean, because currently between the two versions, the only thing that, well, I mean, there were some differences of, of how the text was structured, but in a sense, most of it was identical, just replacing everywhere it said, uh, you know, the applicant shall demonstrate that the proposed development will not have an undue adverse effect upon, and this one here says the proposed subdivision will not have an undue adverse effect upon, um, so that's why we chose to propose it that way. Okay. Uh, well, it's not looking like there's any questions about this one. Do we have uh, a motion for this? Do we, have, do we have a motion to accept Mike's suggestion and make that our suggestion, which is to delete most of section 3504A and to delete all of it and replace it with uh, one line that says the traffic provision of subdivision shall be the same as those that apply to conditional use applications in section 3303, except that the word subdivision shall be substituted for development where applicable. Anyone wanna make that motion? I'll make the motion. Okay, Stephanie. I can I, say I, it. I should get my verbiage right, actually. I think it's what, would anyone like to move? So moved. Right. <laughs> Take the boy out of Tennessee. Uh, okay. Move. <laughs> move. <laughs> Motion by Stephanie, seconded by Marcella. All those in favor, say aye. Or no, do we have a, dis I got to train myself. Do we have a discussion of the thing we just discussed? Okay. So it appears we do not. So. All of those in favor say aye. 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 
Those opposed? Okay, so 6 0 for that one. Thank you, Mike. Um, what's up next? So the next two um, go back to our endless conversations for anyone who was here when we did the zoning. Back to planned unit developments. So, um, and these got proposals you guys made and they were amended at the city council as well. So some of these are not exactly what you guys had talked about, um, but uh, in two places in our planned unit developments, which are a type of subdivision, um, there were places where the council required that planned unit developments be used. And the tricky part of this is that um, the projects that are being proposed as, you know, as, as standard subdivisions make a lot of sense um, how they're, they're looking in Sabin's pasture or in other places. This, there are a couple, there, there's another project that will be impacted by these as well. Um, because under the applicability, in other words, who needs to meet a new development, new neighborhood development, they are required for developments of either 40 parcels or dwelling units. And as soon as somebody does 40 units, um, and, and we have a potential project uh, separate from Sabins that may also have more than 40 units, and it's on a single parcel, and it's a single project of a, you know, it'd be a large residential project. And they're automatically would be kicked into having to meet these new neighborhood development requirements, which they can't meet. Um, so I, I didn't like the requirement for either one of these new neighbor, for either one of these, um, PUDs. I think if somebody wants to take advantage of them, we have them and made them available, but as soon as you start requiring them, it's going to start impacting a number of projects that can't meet them. They're either going to take a project that could have 50 units. And they will simply go down and make them 39 units so they don't have to meet it. And we're the only ones who are gonna lose out on the additional housing units. Um, I, I think if somebody wants to get any of the benefits, they obviously have to meet these, these requirements. But um, my opinion has been, um, I, I would not require people to meet these, especially in the cases of the, the Sabins project. It really is building another city street and subdividing on that city street to create new lots and um, some of the requirements that are in the new neighborhood are things that they're either not they don't want to meet or aren't going to be able to meet so um, the proposal was just to strike point b which requires it or number two that requires it and the same is going to be true in the next one which is conservation subdivisions number three requires requires um them to meet that as well. Mike, could you elaborate on the elements of like the new neighborhood that they can't or do not want to meet? So they don't need to have any de uh, density bonuses. Um, So they haven't yet built out what their proposal are for the for some of their proposals. Uh, 
let's see, 40% of the parcel. Um, so one, I think, got down to the open space requirement. Um, either a quarter acre or 40% of the parcel, whichever is greater, shall be set aside as permanently protected open space. So in a project such as theirs, where they're, they're it's a 100 acre parcel, and they're going to be developing and meeting all the requirements in the lower pasture to fit all of their 100 units in the lower pasture, which is what they want, and it meets all the zoning that's required for that, and yet they're going to have to set, us, uh, set aside permanently 40% for open space. Now, they may end up doing that anyways through the public-private partnership or a portion of it. Um, but that ends up being more of a, um, that ends up being a lot of land. I mean, 40% that's setting aside 40 acres. Without that requirement, they can build everything that the lower, the area with the lower portion parcel is, um, is would allow, I believe, 375 units. And they're gonna be putting in 100 and something. They haven't come up with a final, you know, is it 125, is it 140? They, they haven't nailed that down yet. So they're, they're less than the density that's required under there. But because they're doing more than 40 units, they're gonna be required to set aside 40% of their land um, as permanently protected open space. Um, And let's see, they'll have a conservation commission, open space. Yeah, so they had a couple requirements in, in there. Um, so, I mean, it's not, it, it's not impossible for them to meet a number of these other requirements that are in there. They already have design requirements that they have to meet. And they're already gonna have street design requirements that they have to meet that are in the subdivision rules. Um, so a lot of these are a little bit duplicative of stuff they're gonna have to meet anyways. But a lot of the other ones Uh, there is a requirement that development shall include yeah, mixes of housing types, both single and multi-unit. No more than 75% of dwelling units may be of the same type. Um, that might be a problem. They're doing a number of larger, they're, they're doing multifamily housing is their plan. So um, because there's a, a limited amount of space that you can, um, because it has these topographic limitations, it has a certain amount that is going to be a challenge um, to get that. They'll probably end up with more single family if they, if they do develop the upper pasture, but most of the lower pasture will be developed as um, multifamily, um, more of the larger, larger block. Um, units. So there, I think there are going to be a few places um, where it's going to be a challenge. But until we see more of the details, we won't know that one. Um, the conservation subdivision is a much more challenging one for them to meet than, than the, the new neighborhood. But we can talk about that one after we go through this one. Mike, can you can you describe like your understanding of the gist of what this is, what you know, what the the buildings are going to be like? Is it going to be like a, like Murray Hill condos, like a like a line of condos or something, or or what? I did, we don't have any plans at this point. Um, all we've seen is a little bit of uh, the road infrastructure um, because. 
there's a separate project next to them and we've been trying to, to build a common road that goes up, that would basically be across the street from Caledonia Spirits. There'd be a road that heads up and then could go into, make a right-hand turn and then go into Sabin's Pasture. And then it follows the grade. It's, it's basically follows about an 8% grade. There's a single road that would be able to head up to reach the upper pasture. Um, and then there'd be a number of buildings that would be on the left and right of that coming down um, to the bottom. And then there's only buildings on the, I would say the upper side of the road because the, the road is down at the railroad tracks at that point. So um, I think they're looking at a number of, of, I don't know, eight, 10, 12 unit buildings, maybe something of that size. Um, but we don't have any specifics at this point and they're not, they're, they're still looking at whether these are senior housing, are these, you know, they're, they're still exploring the uses, but they've got to start to fit them into certain standards. Um, I can maybe provide a little bit of context for some of the commissioners who maybe weren't there at the, at the time. Um, and some of the context for this was that there was a lot of attention placed on this property and area and the discussion was uh, was at first fairly binary in terms of of people against density and then others not against it and it was um, not very constructive and when we I think got more conversation going, the concern had nothing to do with density at all and far more to do with design and as well as um, has access to, you know, the natural features. Um, and you know, there is a, a fairly large um, stream or wetland throughout the, through the property there. So the new neighborhood part, was sort of crafted with a lot of feedback on from folks in that surrounding neighborhood in terms of addressing their concerns while still trying to allow for without putting limits on on the number of households that that we could welcome uh, in Montpelier on that property. Um, so the the shift it it really shifted towards design that tried to address uh, people's concerns. Now, when it, when it got sent to the city council, the zoning district did get changed or got, the parcel got split and part of it got put into rural, which I don't even know how that, that seems like it might be problematic in terms of how are you, or do you now have to have a conservation subdivision and a new neighborhood? I don't know. Um, so that may, may be problematic for it. And I think as, as with anything, when we start to get into these design standards, sometimes it's, it's easy for us um, and others to keep tacking things on that we all support in theory, but before we know it, it may become very difficult to actually do. And I'm, I'm not, I haven't looked at these very closely in a long time, but all of that to say, um, I would think that um, there might be a possibility to either improve some of these or uh, it could be that changing the zoning district or, or there, there may be a way to address some of this. I would not be comfortable just tossing it, especially without one, the applicant not coming and requesting or explaining any of this and without getting any um, feedback or notifying, I think, I think folks in the, the surrounding area, I, I, I think that would be short-sighted of us. Um, yes, of course, we would have to warn a public hearing, but uh, I think addressing some of these, you know, before it gets to a, a public hearing might be wise of us to do when, when this is a, a relatively high profile or could be a controversial um, proposal. Thanks, John. Yeah, I think John John was right, and I, I completely forgot about that. So when we when we developed the planning commission and the proposal, we had 
our approach to Sabin's pasture, we came out with a proposal that says we're going to make it all residential 6,000, which would allow about 400 units in the entire area. But if you were going to do a lot of units, we required you to do a PUD. So we kind of had this bit of approach of saying, we want everybody to cluster all the development at the bottom of the hill, but we're going to keep it all at a medium density and hope that people use the PUD um, and take advantage of it to, to put the development at the bottom of the hill, which is going to be the most cost efficient. A little carrot and stick approach. Um, when city council came in, they simply said, nope, we're just going to mandate that the units all go at the bottom of the hill by putting this in the riverfront district and putting the top in rural and so that allowed for the exact same amount of units almost within like 10 or 15 units it came out pretty close 400 and something units um so they pretty much forced the pud by the zoning rules um but in doing that on like the last day um some of these other things like requiring the pud stayed in so now we've required everybody to be at the bottom and now we're going to require a pud which is kind of, they're not working well together because they weren't intended to work in this way. They were intended to have low density and use this as an incentive to, to have developers take advantage of it. Um, once you've required everybody to be together, now it starts to become strange that you've got these two requirements, one, one for the rural part and another one for the lower part that, and, and the question starts coming up, do we have to keep 40% of the lower higher density area or um, you know how do these how do these work together so you know John's right there was this was proposed to work one way and they made some changes at the city council afterwards and, and we can go back and and revisit this in whatever format we want but I think we have to keep that context in the back of our mind that um, it it was intended to work in a different way so we may have to make some adjustments so Mike, I have a related question in that uh, if, we, if we were to remove density requirements citywide, which is like, it's, you know, that's a movement that's happening um, in other places, would there be any incentive at all for anyone to put in a PUD? Uh, I think I've said this when we were doing, when we were talking about this initially, um, that I've been doing this for about 20 years and people spend a lot of time working on PUD rules and I see very few PUDs ever done unless they're associated with a condominium. Um, those, those types of projects will um, usually require the need for a PUD because they're of how they're grouping the units and, and making things. So very rarely do I see people using them at all in the first place, but... <laughs> Do we, I mean, should we make like relaxed dimensional standards? I mean, do we need, and this is, I'm asking the whole, everyone this, not just Mike, but I mean, do we, do we need to make the PUDs have more incentive or, or? I mean, I'd see, uh, you know, J John's right. I'd agree with John again on the, the, it's, it's all about the design. Really what we want is good design. Um, and I think your idea and I, I you know, Barb, I replied to Barb and, and you guys on that, should we get rid of the density question? Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. It's a conversation we had on the VPA listserv about city of South Burlington, who is looking at it. Um, and it, it's an interesting proposal because it, it really is kind of getting a little bit to form-based code where, um, you know, right now 30, 35% of all housing units are, are occupied by a single person. But most of our um, units are, are two two bedroom um, apartment units, and if somebody were to build a building, you know, you could have identical size building, you know, maybe a, a four thousand square foot footprint, three stories, and you could fit so many units in it. But you're limited, so you you might not put any studios or single bedroom apartments in there because, you know. If I did, I just have to make it a two-story building because I'm not allowed to have any more units, even though really the impact on the neighborhood is, is negligible because of the number of bedrooms is, you know, you could have a, 
I'm allowed to have 10 three bedroom apartments or 10 studios. Um, obviously the, the impact of 10 three bedrooms is gonna be bigger on the neighborhood than the studio. So why not just regulate the bulk and massing of the building and let the developer decide how they want to, you know, based on economics and the, the population dynamics, how many three bedrooms should I make? How many two bedrooms should I make? And how many studios should I make? Because I can only, I only, I can only get a box so big because I'm regulated by footprint, I'm regulated by height, and I'm regulated by the amount of lot coverage. Um, why not give people the freedom to put in the number of units? Um, I, I don't, I, I don't want to. It's a good argument, but I don't. It's that's that's a policy argument for. The right. I, I, I think that we are going to probably have that discussion sometime, um, but we don't need to have that discussion now. The discussion being about whether or not we just want to get rid of density requirements altogether. So that's a, that's a whole big thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I just, just to bring it back to the conversation that we're, we're having here is, you know, if, if not for the density bonus, which doesn't seem like that much of an incentive, I mean. Um, yeah, these guys don't need the density bonus. So yeah. They, they have no reason to voluntarily participate. I think, and I think this whole thing just seems schizophrenic in general. Like there's a lot of, like, like they want a PUD here but which which the only reason you a, a developer would want that is to get density bonus, but then people are really seem concerned about the density. So it's, it seems a little bit like self, you know, contradictory. Um, I don't know. It may I, be that there's there's um, you know essentially what people want is good design, and they would like an element of this property be to be conserved, right? And you can't require. Um, that conservation, but if you are offering something like a density bonus, then, and I think that's how this was crafted, then legally they can develop their property and they don't have to conserve it. But if they are developing it to, we're allowing them to develop it more greater than they, they would otherwise if they provide these um, amenities. So I'm not, I'm, I'm just putting that out there as I, I think that might be why some of that is there. And I think people might may, may not have understood like that the, the density is really tangential, but the, the legally we would need to offer something in order to have that uh, additional requirement. That's why that's where the second hand comes in. That's why you know the manager's office is going to work on a public-private partnership is because they need something. They they can't build this project without the city. Um, it's just not going to financially fly. So we're here to to work with the TIF funding to go and bring in the sewer and water and the roads to help offset some of their costs. And in exchange, when we ask for stuff, and one of the things that's obviously on that list is going to be kind of park how big it is that's that's the negotiation that happens on that side of the ledger um, we can't require that um, public access on from our side we can protect the wetlands we can protect those natural resource those natural features that are in there um, there is the floodplain there is um, wetlands there's steep slope and we can go through and make sure the development does not impact those uh, we can look at the storm water But, um, and we can look at the design and the parking and uh, what the screening looks like and all of those types of, of aspects of the project and then go, go from there on our side. But um, again, I think that's where, I think that's where our conversation has to look is at those regulations. What are the rules? We want to require not only for this one. Um, if if we did keep this, I would still like to get rid of the. You know, if if my recommendation to to strike number two doesn't work, I still would like to strike the dwelling units. 
I still think the 40 dwelling units, um, considering um, this almost came into effect in, in the downtown when we were talking about building the transit center, which first was proposed with 40 dwelling units. Um, we do have an exemption for urban center one, which would have gotten them out anyways, but this other proposal that is being considered also has 40 dwelling units. And I'd hate to see them go and drop it to 35 just to avoid having to meet other, other requirements that don't relate because it's a, um, it's a, it's a pair of buildings that, you know, on a single parcel where most of the rest of this is really looking at a neighborhood, you know, as if you're building 40 single family homes and we're going to design this in a certain way, as opposed to somebody who's in a high density residential district, you know, that's a 29 unit an acre district and they're going to build, um, you know, they've got enough land to go and support building more than 40 units, but now they have to make it a new neighborhood, even though it's a single parcel. Well, so to kind of frame like the situation that, that John brought up um, is that there was a lot of discussion, a lot of public input related to this particular requirement, but that's that alone is not the full context because Mike points out that uh, the entire area was rezoned right before um, the final uh, zoning subdivisions were passed. <clears throat> so that changed the context of, of this. What do, what do we want to do about, about that issue? Um, that the public was involved, but then again, it's like, it's out of context to say that we would be completely undoing what the public was expecting because that was already that you know the land that it was already changed by city council at, at the last second. Um. I feel like it would be good to have specific reasons why we're changing this. We've had nobody attend, and the only documentation we have from the property owner relates to traffic. If the planning commission is going to be the ones recommending this and we have no real documentation as to why, I don't know, uh, or anyone on record even asking for it, um, it seems tenuous. I, think I, can, I can pass that along to them and see if they want to put some specific requests together and and the next meeting. I think I think one policy reason for making this change is that uh, for most of the discussion and the creation of these PUD sections in the in zoning, they were they weren't thought of as being used as a restrictive tool. They were meant at the opposite to be an option for people. Uh, but this provision makes it a restriction instead. Uh, I think that that, I don't know, that would be a reason why I would be concerned with, you know, forcing PUDs onto developments. But I also agree that we should ask for more before making a change. Anybody else have any thoughts about that? Does that sound fine to, to leave it until we know more concretely about why the developer might want this change. And does anybody have in, uh, would anybody like to address what Mike raised and not make, so Mike doesn't feel ignored. He did mention possibly us removing the dwelling units part of the provision, but um, that seems like, that seems like a core thing if we're not gonna change it at all, or if we're not gonna change the other part. Go ahead, Stephanie. I just, my question was around um, the development of this, John, from what you were saying, I'm, I wasn't clear. Was the planned unit development created specifically with Saban's Pasture in mind? Um, not the only property. Uh, there's another uh, property well, on the, other on the side. west side of town. Yeah. Okay, but specifically looking at those two big properties and 
how they get developed. They would they they had large properties in mind. So another option would be also, you know, creating a minimum parcel size. So it's not picking up things that that this wasn't intended for. Um, as another option, but I'm not sure that's that's the first option for that people want to see. So that would be, I think, simple and at least avoid some negative unintended consequences. If if it is only for one parcel, we do run the potential of uh, spot zoning. Uh, But Mike, it sounded like there were, uh, at least in the downtown, there were ways to get out of this anyway, right? In urban center one, yeah. But we have a number of higher density neighborhoods, um, mixed use, residential, um, the riverfront district, and um, residential 1500, all are you know, relatively high density. Which is uh, basically River Station, um, the the down street property on Berry Street. That's pretty much built at 29 units an acre. For somebody who's trying to visualize what that would look like, that's the density of that project. Pioneer over on Pioneer Street, the the old um, oh. The old mill building there that was restored. That's another one that's 29 units an acre. Um, it's an apartment building. So it kind of gives visually what, what that density looks like on the ground. Um, you know, the lane shops next to me right here is like 80 units an acre. Yeah, the, one, the some of the highest density ones are right next to um, Kirby there on on the river there. Those are, can't remember what those were, 60, 50, 60 units an acre, something like that. I'm looking at an 80 unit an acre development and all I hear is crickets right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a couple of like chickens should be in bed, but there's one chicken that seems to be running around. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I will ask them um, to, to provide some input on that. And again, the conservation subdivision is another one that, that functionally has some other issues that administratively, um, when the city council made changes, um, it's how they require subdivisions of four or more parcels in 10 years, it ends up becoming very administratively difficult because if somebody were to subdivide, let's say a, a 50 acre parcel into five parcels and sell them, they're now five separate parcels. We have to track them in house, but one other person could then go and take one of their parcels and subdivide it and therefore prevent everybody else from being able to subdivide their parcel again because of the way it, it's they've all been sold and now all of a sudden you'd want it to subdivide yours again but you can't or the number of units because the one person over here you know plunked down a, a five unit building and it just just the way logically it's it's envisioning as if one person subdivides the five and keeps all five parcels and then we're going to regulate them going forward but a lot of times, even if somebody subdivided it into five parcels, only sold off one, that one person could use up all the development rights from all the other projects on their one parcel. And administratively, it just becomes crazy because of the way the conservation subdivision is written. So it's another one. If there's one that really, really needs work, it's the conservation subdivision, because I think it's, it's very difficult, um, especially when you get into the minimum 40% maximum 60% um, 
or alternatively, here's, here's another one. You've got a 50 acre parcel. I sell five acres to John. John then turns around and subdivides, triggering the entire original subdivision of two into a conservation subdivision where 40 to 60% must be conserved. Well, who, who has to do that conservation? Is it John who owns five acres or is it me who no, owns 45 acres? It's you. <laughs> and wait a second here, I, we, I only made a one lot subdivision. So why am I now in a conservation subdivision? I only made a one lot, one, you know, a two lot subdivision and sold one parcel. Now all of a sudden 60% of my parcel is being conserved. It, how fair is that? And how can we legally do that? But the way the conservation subdivision is written, legally, if John does that, he, he actually could revert all that conservation back on me. And it's, it's, it's a, administratively, it's, it doesn't work. And it's just fortunate that we don't get a lot of subdivisions in these rural areas. But it, it is very problematic the way it's the way it's set up. And if you were to read through it and start to, to follow out some possible paths, um, you'd start to realize how, how tricky that one is. Um, just the track and follow and, but, but again, I can, we can talk about that. Um, I'll pass both of those requests on to the, the Sabins development team and see if they can put together some thoughts. Um, I'm sure Dan can put together a, a more coherent because they're for, more familiar with what their project is. We, we have very little here in our office of what exactly is being proposed. And I think they're not sure of what they're proposing because they're not sure what rules they have to meet. And that's really a lot of this initial conversation right now is, you know, do I have to meet this or not? And we're like, well, right now you do. So um, let's see what, where this goes and what that would mean for your project. But we can let them go with that. Well, I, I, I like to believe that when we do things like this, I know we're, we're being asked to look at something because of a, of a property owner, but I at least tell myself that we are not just following what proper, like, you know, this we're not just following the squeaky wheel, that this is just our opportunity to re-examine what's working with some new information. Um, like, so, so I'm always fine when we want to make like a, you know, policy decision that's off of what exactly is in front of us or, or just to re-examine the whole thing, which sounds like kind of what we're doing. Um, I don't know, with that in mind, do we look, do you want to go ahead and take a look at the fourth suggestion to see if, if it's this in the same category of concern that John was mentioning before? And it appears that Carolyn can hear me right now and I will tell her she did a fantastic job in the Shakespeare play uh, last weekend. I have headphones on. She can't hear you. Oh, I should have noticed. Well, you can relay that. Um, do we want to take a look at the fourth thing here, the conservation subdivision? Yeah, I mean, I gave most of this the, the, the same summary. It mostly just comes down to the requirement piece for subdivisions of four or more parcels in 10 years in the rural district. Unless the parcels are counted as another part of the PUD. So again, um, a lot of these already, um, these were tended to be less directly associated with the Sabins and Crestview projects because those were already in residential 6,000, residential 9,000 as we developed the rules. And it was only later on that they ended up in, um, that Sabins ended up in the conservation, the rural residential area for conservation. So now the development in the rural will be a conservation PUD in the lower portion, depending on how we figure out how these two play with each other, um, being in two separate districts. John, yeah, new, new neighborhoods does not apply in the rural area, but the parcel that we're talking about includes some land in rural and some land in riverfront. And the other one applies 
to the rural district, but not to the lower pasture. So it's kind of like we've got a PUD that's required up here and a PUD that's required down here, but it's a single parcel. So we're going to have to figure out how these interact. Or maybe we make it all one zoning district. That would probably complicate their project, but do we, that is always an option. Do we, do we have the same concerns? I mean, it, this does seem a bit different. This does, this doesn't have, doesn't seem like the same, it's like it, it wasn't as, as controversial or concerning to the public. Yeah. Do you think it has the same concerns, John? That we should we should wait before removing something like this, or or do you think we'd be okay to? Uh, I I don't know. I would like more reasoning, or even more more time to think about and go through what the implications would be, because I'm not. I don't know. I I think that as currently laid out or, or our current regulations have some problems and that they need addressing. I just don't know if just getting rid of crossing those things out, um, one, gets them what they, what they really, you know, or what we really want as a community and does it, like, what are the implications one way or another? Are we going to either not get the most we can out of the you know housing unit there and are we going to get an optimal design or not um well mike did did this cha proposed change come directly from uh the developer or the um you know the, the property owners or was this one that you were more concerned with uh it came up in our conversation with them as we were trying to go through what were the possible issues that would come up. They had identified the new neighborhood um, requirement. Um, we didn't get into it a lot with the specifics um, at the time of which ones were going to be issues. Um, but when they talked about the requirement there, you know, I pointed out that with the rural area at the top, that's another required another one. Those were the only two PUDs that had requirements. There are a number of PUDs in here that are enabled, but not required. These are the only two that have requirements. Um, so it was pointed out that this one would be another one. And this is one that um, he, Alan Goldman had opposed at the city council adoption at the time it happened, at the time they put this in, he opposed that piece. And so it's not surprising that because he's a partner in, in this one that he would be opposed to it again. Um, so. Okay. And, uh, okay. So yeah, I think I, I'm starting to remember some details of, of Mr. Goldman coming in and having requests during the zoning of the planning commission and he apparently owns some land on the uh east side of town that's in the west rural. is it on okay the west side of town that's in the rural yeah district so yeah, he's probably probably the largest landowner by acreage in the city 600 700 acres he might have okay okay so this is starting to seem more like having a completely different motivation than the savings project then? Initially, yes. His concern was more about his property over at Crestview and the, the land got heading into Middlesex. But with the rezoning of Sabins to include rural, it now affects his other project that he's gotten involved in. So. As he talks about what potential development um, could happen in the future on the upper part of the pasture, then then this is going to start impacting that side. Okay. I'm starting to see a need for us to have more information than and... 
Yeah, and I'll see if we can get Dan Richardson. He's, as I said, he's been the attorney and he's well versed in, in looking at these types of things. And I think he would do a, a better job than I am because again, he's more familiar with what is being proposed and what specifically may be impacted. Okay. I have to leave a little early, so I have to sign off, but um, I think that sounds like a good plan to talk about this more later when we have more time to think about it and maybe some community or public input. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, it looks like we're pretty much done. It ain't dark. Yep. Yeah, I don't know when that happened. It's dark at seven now. Yeah, so the other two that were in there that were just little technical things to fix were just um, a couple of things that we'd found. And my zoning administrator is going to pick around to see if there were any others that we needed to put in a little fix it list. So, you know, that figure 310 was talking about on the left was talking about greater than or equal to 10%. And then in the written description, it said just greater than 10%. So, it should be consistent on the left and right. Um, and then the other one is uh, an insertion for the natural resources protection, which isn't really doing, it, it already is a requirement in some ways. Um, they have to meet the river hazard rules, but if we require them to put the river hazard area on the plat, then we get a number of points in our community rating system for FEMA. And so that was just a requirement that said, if you're gonna do a subdivision um, and you have river hazard areas, then you have to show the boundaries of, and the districts and sub-districts of the river hazard area on those plats. Um, so it's not really that big of a, of a requirement for people, but it, it gives us some additional points as uh, as FEMA goes and makes it clear and documented for anyone who buys the land where the flood hazard is. Um, but we're going to look at a couple other little pieces um, and decide whether they make sense as quick fixes or whether or not they're they're important. We've had people periodically come in and um, want to change, tweak some of the language regarding fences. Um, we've had a couple little hiccups when it comes to the table of uses, especially as it comes to housing, whether we want to make those fixes now. And we'll talk about those as staff and, and send you them if we decide they're worthy of doing. Um, we have descriptions in here of specific uses. So if you were in section 310 or 320, it goes through some specific uses and discusses a different number of different things, including like rooming and boarding houses and assisted living facilities. And then if you go to the use table where it shows what uses are allowed, there isn't any rooming and boarding housing uh, on that table. So, and they're allowed anywhere that it's permitted on the table, except that it doesn't appear on the table anywhere. So uh, campgrounds are another one. It's a specific use. We have all these rules describing what you need to do if you wanna have a campground, except campgrounds are not in the use table anywhere. So we just have a couple of these that we, we might need to just go back and um, make sure that we we don't have any internal consistency inconsistencies, um, and we'll talk about those. Meredith and myself just to go through and see if there are any little tweaks like that. If we've got if we're going to adopt some amendments, we might as well clean up a few little things here and there if they, if it makes sense. But we're not looking at opening up any large policy things. You know, we still need to fix the sign rules. We know that, but we don't think this is the time or the place to be opening up that can of worms. Um, again, if anybody on the commission wants to open up a can of worms, that's, you know, you guys can let me know and we'll put together a proposal, to look at some other things, but we were just looking, looking for specific fixes. Okay. Well, uh, uh, does anyone have any questions about the, the two technical changes? Well, the first one's a technical change. The second one's, um, uh, I guess, I don't know information seeking type change. Uh, anybody have any questions on these? Uh, okay. Uh, do we have a, a motion to um, 
to uh, suggest the two changes that uh, Mike has put forward. Oh, I, um, I don't know if we need a motion on the two small ones, but that's up to you guys. Do you want? Uh, why? Why is that, Mike? Do you? Do you? Oh, it's uh, we're. I mean, we're just reviewing them at this point. I don't know if those some of those technical ones are not don't have as much policy. Okay, I I just to them. okay. Um, I thought we could just go ahead and get it out of the way so that so that when you come back later with some other minor ones, you don't have to. Oh, you wouldn't okay. Don't to include it or anything. I, um, I mean, we've got the two changes. I should say recommend adoption. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, so is Aaron, Aaron is moving for that? The changes? Uh, do we have a second? A second. Okay, we have a second from John. Uh, any discussion? I mean, no discussion? Okay, those in favor of making the two uh, small changes? As Mike suggested, say aye. 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 Any, uh, those opposed? Okay. Uh, so I think that was 5 0. Any abstentions? Okay, so everyone was in favor. Okay, so so those so those suggestions pass. They're, you know, we can put those away for now. Uh, and then when Mike comes back with other like minor suggestions, like, yeah, we don't have to include those two. So. Uh, no, we'll have one more. Um, I don't know how we, we missed it with the most recent changes to the design review boundary up there on Terrace Street. Apparently when the Regional Planning Commission put the map together, they removed five parcels and they were only supposed to remove three. So we'll have to go back and that'll be another correction that we'll have to get adopted. Um, and unfortunately, for whatever reason, I didn't even, I, I remember checking it, but it, I didn't catch the fact that they took out some extra parcels and I was working on a separate project, opened up the, natural re, uh, the national register map, which, that boundary is supposed to follow and realize that there are now two parcels that are out that should be in. So we're going to have to go through and do a correction to put those two back in. Is that where they live? Pam D'Andrea, just uh, moving herself out of the... <laughs> yeah. Is that where Claire lives? Uh, yeah, we had, so yeah, there were the five parcels on Terra Street. We had that were taken out and there was only supposed to be three. So the first two, first two got to go back in. Okay. So that'll be on the fix it list. Okay. Uh, so what, what are we thinking about for next time? Um, do we have any more chapters lined up or will we by then, Mike? I hope to have transportation. They are, Many times as they tell me this is the last meeting, this is going to be the last, last meeting and the last, last, last meeting. So we'll hopefully have transportation. Okay. Um, and I'm still uh, trying to, uh, DPW has been kind of short staffed the past uh, couple weeks. So I haven't gotten a chance to meet with them on the utilities, but um, I'm thinking I'll get some opportunities coming up after Thursday to meet with them to work on utilities and facilities, which is mostly in draft form. And that one doesn't have to go through committees, so that should go a little bit faster. Um, and I guess the other related issue we've got to talk about is the next meeting is Columbus Day. Are we moving to a Tuesday? Are we skipping Columbus Day and meeting on the 26th next? What's our pleasure do you, have it, do you have it off? I don't think people actually celebrate Columbus Day. Uh, yeah, I think they call it Indigenous Persons Day now, but it is it is a holiday for the city. 
I, I think I I think Tuesday's fine. I don't see any reason to um, to skip it. Uh, what What do you guys think? If Mike has a day off, I don't want to force him to. If we go to Tuesday, we'll miss CVRPC. I'm not. Yeah, that's right. That I just think usually you is. should yeah. know. I'm fine missing it. So you're yeah, it sounds like you're in favor of a Tuesday then. <laughs> uh, just yeah, means you have to Monday, leave at. You just Monday. means you have to leave at seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Monday's off the table. I mean, uh, you know, as. Mike was definitely implying like, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so Tuesday, anybody else? Uh, does anybody have a problem with Tuesday? The Tuesday after Indigenous Peoples Day? Yeah, I think it's okay. Okay. Try to send out plenty of warnings. Let's do that. All right, well, with that, I think we can adjourn a little early. So we have a motion. So moved. Moved by Stephanie. Second by. I'll do it. John. All in favor of adjournment? Aye. 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 Okay. We're adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tell have Carol. a great night. Tell Thanks, Carol this was awesome. I will. Later. Yeah. Bye.